Good morning and welcome to First Lutheran Church where we gather to worship together as God's people. We come together to pray, to sing, to hear God's word, to confess our sins, and to eat a meal together on occasion. We are glad that you are joining us and hope that your life will be blessed by the time that you spend worshiping with us. If you would like myself, Pastor Naomi, or Pastor Jim to come to your home, to your apartment, to your room, please give the church office a call and we'll be more than happy to come and visit you. Thank you for being with us today and God's blessings. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to worship this morning. It is good to have all of you here as we gather on this bright Easter morning. Our service is pretty much all in your bulletin except for the hymns, and so just follow along and sing boldly as we come together as God's people today. I invite you to stand as we begin with our confession and forgiveness. We do come together as we live in the strong and living name of our God, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, Come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto each and every one of you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together, Jesus Christ is risen today.
Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead to bring everlasting hope, be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. from above and for salvation let us pray to the Lord for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become the Lord of life. Increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ, and help us to grow as your people towards the fullness of eternal life with you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning. Our first reading is Acts 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Our second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, and which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I am, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he peer, appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace turn toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not, I put the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim that so you have come to believe.
Thank you. Our Easter gospel this morning is found in the 20th chapter of St. John, and due to its length, I invite you to remain seated and just sit back and uh, let this story uh, sink in a little bit. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. As for yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the Easter Gospel. Grace to you and Easter joy from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like you to take a moment and look at the sermon notes if you haven't already. Now, I know there's going to be some peril in calling your attention to the Where's Jesus picture. Almost all of you, I expect, have seen the Where's Waldo pictures that have spawned countless children's books and have captivated the attentions of kids and adults alike, looking for that elusive Waldo in his iconic uh, striped red sweater and his stocking cap. Now, this picture is done in that style, but instead of looking for Waldo, you're looking for Jesus. Unlike when you're looking for Waldo, however, you don't know what Jesus looks like. He doesn't have on a red sweater. But you'll know him when you see him, I guarantee you that. The peril is you may find this puzzle more captivating than what I have to say, but that's a risk I'm willing to take. As we begin this morning, I'm going to ask you three questions. Three, I'm going to ask the same question three times, and I want you to answer three times with the same words. When I say, people of God, why are you re- weeping? You respond, where's Jesus? People of God, why are you weeping? Jesus? People of God, why are you weeping? Jesus? People of God, why are you weeping? Jesus? Where's Jesus? I'll tell you. Where's Jesus? That's what Mary Magdalene wanted to know. When she comes to Jesus' tomb and finds that it's empty, that massive stone had been rolled away from the entrance and his body was gone. First, she runs to Peter and one of the disciples and says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they've laid him. Where is Jesus? They go back to the tomb. And after Peter and the disciple have seen for themselves, she stands there crying. And then looking into the tomb, she sees two angels sitting there. And she says to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Where's Jesus? And finally, Jesus himself approaches her. 
and she doesn't recognize him. And he says, woman, why are you weeping? And, he, and, if you, and she says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. You can almost hear the panic in her voice. Where's Jesus? Now, various answers were proposed to that question in various Gospels and throughout history. As Naomi mentioned, this story is told in four Gospels. The chief priest suspected that his own disciples had stolen the body to fake the resurrection. And some Christians later on say that Jesus had walked out of the tomb on his own. He hadn't really died. After all, the Son of God can't die. So he had just walked out. And there's some scholarly suspicion that Jesus wasn't put into a tomb at all. Because of the severity of his crime, the Romans would have just thrown him into a mass grave for the, for the coyotes and the birds to pick at. But for Mary and the disciples, for the most part, it was just pretty much shock and awe. They didn't know what to think. They didn't know where he was. Nothing could prepare them for what they found in the tomb which was really nothing. And when they found out that his body was missing, the only thing that they can think is, where is he? Where's Jesus? Someone had taken away their Lord and they did not know where to find him. Now, kids can often cut to the heart of things. I believe in Jesus, a five-year-old whispered to her dad in church one day after the congregation had confessed the creed. You know, we say, I believe in Jesus Christ. She said, I believe in Jesus, but, she went on, I've never heard his voice, and I've never seen his face. Where is Jesus? That might be a good time for Dad to play the parent card and say, Shh, we don't talk in church. <laughs> That's a tough question. We might pray that he, she forgets the question by the time the service is over. But this morning I'm going to go where angels fear to tread and give her and you a direct answer to the question, Where's Jesus? Actually, several answers to the question. Where's Jesus? For my first answer, I'm simply going to quote the Gospel of Mark. And this would probably be a good answer for that little girl. Mark gives a little different account, which we read in John, of what happens to Mary Magdalene. For one thing, she's accompanied by some other women. And a young man, probably an angel, greets them at the tomb. And when they ask, where's Jesus? He says to them, he's been raised. He is not here. He has gone ahead of you to Galilee. Well, I could tell you the same thing this morning. He has been raised. He's not here. He has ascended into heaven. Jesus is no longer present anywhere in the world the way that you and I or this pulpit are. He's gone. He's no longer present here. He has ascended into heaven. Thomas said, uh, he, Jesus said to Thomas, I go to prepare a place for you. He has gone ahead of us, not to Galilee, but to heaven. And in other words, his absence, in a way, is kind of a good thing. I say it's a good thing because we know our future is in his hands. There is something good waiting for us on the other side of this life. As Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Where's Jesus? He's in heaven. But now, if you are struggling with your faith, if you're one of those people that thinks about your faith, and we all do this once in a while, he's not here, he's in heaven, might not be a completely satisfying answer. For you strugglers, I have a different answer, and it's just as true as the first. Jesus is here. As the Apostle Paul said to the people in Corinth who were having a hard time understanding, he said, you are the body of Christ. And you here this morning, you are the body of Christ. You are his hands to help people in need. You are his mouth to proclaim his love and forgiveness. You are his feet to spread his message to the ends of the earth. Where is Jesus? He's right here. This community of believers embodies Christ. That means we give him a body. And we are the church. We are his incarnation. And I'm not speaking in metaphors. We're real. 
Jesus is here at 612 North Randall Avenue in Janesville, Wisconsin, 53545. For those who would say that Jesus, the church has lost its relevance, I beg to differ. If the church dies, Jesus Christ dies. What an awesome and wonderful responsibility and opportunity that we have to keep Jesus Christ alive in the world. We have been shaped in his image. We are not just any community seeking to do good in the world. We are the body of Christ. Where is Jesus? Here's another answer. This morning, Jesus is sitting at the hospital bedside in Madison of a fragile child receiving chemo for leukemia. He is the skillful hands of the doctors and nurses. He is the soothing touch of a mother and father. He is with the friends at home praying for her. Jesus is in our prayers as we reach out individually or by name. Jesus is with the suffering and with the sick and with the dying, even while we're sitting here. Now, it's true that doctors can perform their healing arts without any knowledge of Jesus Christ. Most parents love their children and when, would do anything for them, whether or not they are Christians. But nothing or no one else can address the needs of someone who is suffering like someone who possesses the power of Jesus Christ. When any one of you sets at the bedside of a sick child or a dying parent, you have with you the power of prayer and healing in the name of Jesus Christ and the assurance that he is there with them with a message of hope and salvation and eternal life. Jesus Christ offers the promise of eternal life. That's why we're here this morning to hear that promise. And in this war-torn world, where's Jesus? Where was Jesus when the terrorist bombs ripped through the airport and at the subway station in Brussels this past week? Why would Jesus allow this to happen? Where was he? But even before the dust settled and the screams began to ring out, Jesus was present in their midst, crying over yet another example of the destructive power that lies in the hearts of humanity, God's own creation. Jesus stood there and wept as he wept over Jerusalem because the people's sins were literally killing them. And as he stood there, we can hear him pray as he did for those who crucify him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This week, once again, we join people around the world with feelings of fear and anger, frustration. We're afraid we're not safe. Our families are not safe. We are angry at those who profess a religion of peace and that they commit acts of war and terror in its name. We are frustrated because it seems that the most powerful country on earth can do little or nothing to stop it. Today, Jesus is in all of our hearts, working to keep us from our inclination to repay evil with evil. If acts of hatred such as these cause us to hate in turn, then there is no hope. And I don't know where Jesus is. I think one of the most challenging things that Jesus ever said was, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And never was that command any more challenging than now. Hate is not in the vocabulary of Jesus Christ, and we must wash its black stain, the stain of hate from our souls as well. Or Jesus is crucified all over again. Finally, let me give you one more answer, and then you can go back to the puzzle. Where's Jesus? He's right over there. Well, I was going to say the altar. He's right over there on that table. He's there in the bread and the wine. And it's my prayer this morning, when we come up here to the, uh, to the rail, 
shoulder to shoulder, in this loving community, hearing those words of forgiveness and sharing greetings of peace that we will know we will know once and for all the answer to that question. Where's Jesus? But let me ask you three more times, and I'm going to ask a different question, and you have a different response. When I ask you, people of God, where is Jesus? You respond, he is risen. People of God, where is Jesus? He is risen. People of God, where is Jesus? He is risen. People of God, where is Jesus? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. I invite you to stand as we boldly confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. On this most holy day, let us pray to God for the church, the earth in all in need, that the whole world may know the resurrection that God promises to give. O God of life, pour your, the life of your Son's resurrection into all churches. Make us visible in the unity that we have in you. Show us the strengths of others. Lord, in your mercy, give to the lands and seas the life of your continuing creation. Water the flowers of springtime and nurture the growing crops. Bless all who protect your plants and animals. Lord, in your mercy, grant to all nations and communities your life of peace. Keep us from war and violence. Lead us into justice. Turn enemies into friends. Today we especially pray for Belgium, Syria, Nigeria, Yemen, Iraq, Jerusalem, and Chicago. Lord, in your mercy, visit the needy with your compassionate life. Feed the hungry, nurse the sick, protect the weak, comfort the sorrowful, attend the dying. Today we especially pray for Rick, Sally, Janet, Vernus, Mary, Matt, Edith, Diane, Ruby, and Millie, and those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, raise up all who gather in your name today with the life of your spirit. Reveal in our words and actions the signs of Christ's resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. O God of life, we praise you for the faithful who have met you in death. Bring us all through death into the life of your resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. O God, we praise your life. We bless your mercy. We honor your power. Transform all of us with the joy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and in whose name we pray. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you. We continue with the great thanksgiving which is printed in your bulletins.
is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. And the night before he died, our Lord and Savior took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be honor and glory in your church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the Lord's table, and you are all welcome here, for the gifts of God are free. You may be seated.
I invite you to stand. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, give you strength and peace today and into your life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And now until we meet again, receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. peace to serve our risen Lord. <laughs>